Welcome to Leaders of Tomorrow Season 9. This is the series which is aiming to empower a billion dreams. And we have a very special guest with us whose entire life has been about enabling his own vision and empowering others' entrepreneurship. We have with us a very special guest on the opening week of Leaders of Tomorrow Season 9. We are joined by co-founder of Starbucks and a renowned entrepreneur, Zev Siegel. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, Leaders of Tomorrow Season 9. You know, we cannot have a better start of this season than having somebody like you, who is like we were speaking before we started, who has been there, done that. This has been basically, you know, your entire life revolves around enabling entrepreneurship. But to start with, uh, you know, before we deep dive into uh, various aspects of entrepreneurship, I want to ask you a question which is totally linked to the current scenario uh, that we have globally that is especially in the post covid world you know so many things have changed so many things have become technology dependent so many things have become redundant like going to office if you are thinking of starting a business today or if you are an upcoming entrepreneur right now what would be your strategy what would be your thought process well these are crazy times Samir. one of the issues is what field would be a good field to enter right now and i think that uh, uh, specialty uh, software of any kind, um, what we call niche software that fits a narrow uh, band of customers, very good idea. Bringing AI into uh, areas that uh, artificial intelligence, bringing it into areas where it is not yet present, great idea. And another idea that uh, is unfortunately being generated by the COVID epidemic is the possibility of acquiring assets at low cost from companies that are, are out of money and uh, recapitalizing uh, those companies and waiting for COVID to end and then going into business. I think there's some pretty great opportunities uh, in that way. But I think uh, as have also what has happened is while typically a crisis like this presents uh, multiple opportunities, at the same time, it ends up killing multiple opportunities or existing opportunities. And, and we can see that happening around us here in India, there in US, everywhere we are seeing that happening. Now, when a tectonic shift like this happens, it leaves behind certain permanent changes which are there forever. As per your observation and your reading, which are those changes? Are we actually getting into a scenario where more and more people would prefer working from home? There'll be less cost incurred on setting up offices and setting up the entire back end to run those offices, people traveling to work, all of that. There are winners and losers right now. For instance, uh, there's great fear among uh, investment funds that are holding uh, large office buildings all over the world. They're, they're yeah. really scared, and they should be. Transit systems and their suppliers, the people who supply you know, everything that a transit system needs, those companies, uh, they're worried too. In many parts of the world, the use of public transit has actually decreased for fear of being uh, in, in a crowd. So these are areas that are not doing well. On the other hand, there are, oh, food and beverage. Food and beverage, not doing well. Grocery and supermarkets, doing great. So for instance, I'm pretty familiar with the coffee world. Coffee companies that supply supermarkets with uh, consumer packages of coffee, their sales are up. Coffee companies that only have coffee bars, their sales are down. So it's a very yeah. nuanced situation. But, you know, starting a new business has always required great study of the marketplace. And now it's just more complicated to do those studies. There are more factors, but the, the, what we call the homework, the, the need to uh, do research, it's greater than ever. Right. Zev, if you are launching Starbucks today, you know, three things that you would do uh, on priority before launching a business like Starbucks in today's times. First of all, would you do it today? If you were launching it, you know. Ah, today, if we were actually going to launch a new company, uh, well, 
I would, in the present market, I would study the availability of distressed assets, of things that are available for sale, including whole companies, let alone equipment, uh, uh, and talent. Don't forget, talent is also available. Um, I would study that as a primary part of any plan to start a new company. Securing capital, always very difficult for entrepreneurs, is now even harder. Right. Uh, right. Entrepreneurs aren't the only ones who are looking around them, trying to decide what's going to happen. Investors are too. And when investors pause to study markets and to think more deeply, it makes entrepreneurs crazy because opportunities are, don't stay open. You know, their opportunities are time sensitive. So, you know, these are issues in the time of COVID that when you look around, look difficult. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to open a restaurant now in most cities in the world, uh, you would not be able to raise money because investors just think that restaurants are in trouble, especially in, a, in an area where there are office buildings. There's nobody in those buildings in the United States. It's, it's a very uh, difficult situation in terms of funding and identifying opportunities. In India, if you have one formal business, which is a, a well-said business and it's thriving, it ends up supporting seven to eight uh, formal businesses and it ends up supporting another 10 to 12 informal businesses which would generate employment like from a normal tea coffee vendor to maybe a, a sandwich vendor and things like that. Now because that entire value chain is under major stress and almost non-existent in some places like you mentioned rightly in US we have seen that happening in business districts in London and many other capitals or financial centers. Do you think there is a need to recalibrate the entire uh, business strategy and accept the new normal uh, as soon and as easily as possible and then maybe go back on drawing board if you're not already into business but thinking of starting something? I think that the, uh, the ripple effects of, that you describe where you drop a stone in the water and then the ripples extend out from where you drop the stone. That's what we're experiencing now. COVID is like a stone dropping in the water and now all the little businesses like dominoes falling in a domino game, they're starting to fail or at least lose customers so that they are no longer profitable. And by the way, this when you have a business that's open but not profitable, it is also consuming probably the family's money is really a danger. I mean, it's, it's like putting money in an incinerator. You know, it just goes up in smoke. The need to, to try and retain capital is really strong. And I think that a lot of entrepreneurs in feeder businesses, like for instance, packaging companies that supply uh, food manufacturers, these people are in a precarious situation. But for entrepreneurs, you know, there used to be an expression that was very popular, there's money to be made on the way down. And what that means is yeah. um, as the economy shrinks or as a business starts to fail, there's an opportunity. For instance, uh, Eastman Kodak in the United States was heavily into the photography business, failed to make the transition into the computer age and uh, virtually disappeared. But there were assets in that company, patents and various things that uh, enabled other people to acquire, there were other people were able to acquire and then money was made doing that. I think those kind of opportunities exist for people who can study what is going to be valuable in the future. The effect of COVID is going to be felt for years. I'm not, we'll have a vaccine and the world will eventually be totally vaccinated or enough to prevent the spread. But then what? what ha all the capital that uh, was vaporized in the COVID epidemic will be gone. And so it'll be hard to fund companies. I think because of that, it's, it's going to require very insightful planning and good connections with um, people who still have capital um, for entrepreneurs to enter a new venture. I work with people who are starting new ventures. There is activity out there. The world has not stopped. You have put the main point on the table, which is basically funding and a lot of companies, especially uh, in the SMB category are actually going to run into that situation. You know, some of them might have already been into that situation and we have seen huge fiscal stimulus and uh, those steroids of monetary support being offered by various governments and central banks all over the world, including in India. Coming back to India. First of all, have you been to India lately? The only my only experience with India was two years ago. I spent a week in uh, Hyderabad, which is uh, an old city and a new city, and uh, yeah, uh, it was really impressive to me. 
Did you visit Starbucks? I visited, I visited coffee bars in uh, India. Uh, in, I visited a Starbucks and several independent coffee bars in Hyderabad. I had a wonderful time. The reason I ask this question is because, you know, in a country like India, even in cities, a lot of those uh, aspirational upcoming entrepreneurs are actually using avenues like Starbucks and other coffee chains as their <laughs> operational offices. They can't really uh, invest in swanky offices and the support staff and all. You know, for somebody in India, it's actually, it can be an experience zone, especially for youngsters. At the same time, it can be a very sort of marketplace, a mini marketplace for somebody who's trying to do something with his life or trying to set up a business in a region in India. What would be your advice to them? What they need to focus on, especially in this new normal? To all of the young entrepreneurs that are listening to this broadcast, I have important news for you. You have to do the numbers. You have to understand how money will flow through your company. Passion is a requirement. An understanding of the field that you're in is a requirement, but you really need to understand the numbers. Now, why is that? Why, why does an adventurous entrepreneur like me want you to be more like an accountant? Well, the answer is you don't have to be an accountant, first of all, <laughs> uh, yeah. but you have to have one near you and you have to be able to talk to lenders and to investors and to the people on your team about the financial realities of your company. The, you know, the Nike, the Nike phase that everybody loves, go for it, just do it. Just do it. Yeah. Well, just do it doesn't work if you don't, don't understand the finances of your company. But I constantly remind the people I work with, no one person knows everything in a startup. There is no such person. You can't be good at everything, but you have to understand what you're not good at and then compensate for it by having other people near you, either as partners or advisors or vice president. But you have to compensate for what you don't understand. And eight times out of 10, what you don't understand is the finances. What is your core investment philosophy? My advice is that the investors should focus on the talent, not the product. Invest, smart investors invest in the people that are running the company. is your investment philosophy because i mean this is your life you keep investing and you keep analyzing businesses the new business ideas what is your core investment philosophy well smart investors uh, i've talked to a lot of investors um, you know i used to dislike investors when i was starting companies but now that i'm advising companies i can see that the investors have a point of view which is they need full information um, in addition to the entrepreneur's optimism and uh, his or her uh, knowledge, they need some realism in it and basic information. My advice is that the investors should focus on the talent, not the product. Invest, smart investors invest in the people that are running the company. For instance, a talented team of you know two women and a, and a man who are developing uh, uh, phone apps that have some new qualities that people are just going to love, especially corporations. They just can't wait to get these new phone apps. Well, you have to look at not the not, not the apps. Uh, the investor will smart investors will always look at that team. Do they have experience? Do they seem to understand the financial aspect? Do they have respect for the investor's money? And do they have respect for the competitors? Or do they keep saying, oh, the competitors know nothing? Uh, that's not true. Competitors frequently very formidable adversaries. So it's the people that are so much a part of the center of an investor's decision. Zev, what is happening is, uh, you know, there is this whole thriving digital ecosystem which exists everywhere. And there are so many examples that we see where actually uh, the existence of that digital layer has helped businesses transform very rapidly. For example, let's say something like Uber. Now, if Google Maps didn't exist, probably Uber would not have been there or maybe they would have taken a couple of more years to be where they are. Can we say that this is, I mean, immaterial of COVID or what is happening around us, this is the golden age for entrepreneurship. 
Is that a right statement to make? I would say pre-COVID, we were in the golden age earlier this year. Okay. The 70s, the 1970s, when I started Starbucks and in the 80s and the 90s, when I was involved in other companies, uh, and since the year uh, 2005, I've been an advisor to companies. That wasn't the golden age. What makes the golden, what made the golden age, which is pre-COVID and post-COVID, I might say, is the advent of the internet and the creation at the same time of a culture of entrepreneurship. You know, prior to uh, say about 1990, entrepreneurs were pretty much on their own. They didn't have the accelerators and special organizations to support them. Angel groups, uh, that is groups of investors who uh, looked at deals together, weren't very uh, vibrant at that time, but these things have all changed. Now, uh, up until March of this year, we had a situation where communication was fast, uh, investors were accessible, there were big, through organizations of investors, like the, the World Angel Investment Forum, the WABF, worldwide organization of investment forums. And these organizations created a situation, oh, there's another thing, the entrepreneurs themselves were treated by the world as really important people. They're creating jobs, as you said uh, yourself, when um, a new company is formed, it has suppliers and those companies prosper. There's this ripple effect of a positive one of added economic activity. Now, COVID kind of disrupted us a little bit, but COVID is not forever. So I would say that the 21st century is the golden era of entrepreneurship. There's a lot of st underlying support for the, uh, the world of startups. If we look at uh, your own journey also, you know, it, it's quite eventful because obviously your own growth and the way your career moved, that is one thing. But the, the world itself went through multiple transitions. So if we trace the journey of globalization from 70s to where we are today, 50 years, there has been a sea change. Now suddenly what we observe is that the whole idea and rationale of globalization itself has kind of come under a major scrutiny in every country. Even in India, we have this self-reliant India mission that is floated by Prime Minister himself. And everybody, every country is basically talking about being self-reliant, and somewhere this whole, uh, I would say, not dismantling, but at least delinking to some extent from the global supply chain. This is that additional layer of complete uncertainty and disruption that's happening at global level. What is your take on that? The politics of the world are definitely moving in the direction of uh, protectionism, countries looking out for themselves. But I, you know, in my contact with um, startup companies, I'm working with people who are internationalists. I'm working with uh, a team in Panama that has identified luxury food products that are created in Panama, chocolate and uh, coffee. And he's identified it from his own uh, work experience in Hong Kong, Beijing, and Tokyo. And they are setting up a company that's going to connect these products with consumers in, uh, in Asia. Smart. So it's a really interesting idea. So, you know, by the politics, uh, you know, it might be uh, isolationist, as you were describing, for startup companies that can identify niche markets, the narrow, narrow band markets, there's still lots of opportunity internationally. Indian companies have a big advantage because uh, India has been an international exporter for hundreds of years. Hundreds. Right. And the United States is different. The United States is a young country. And it's a big market, big wealthy market. So a lot of startups in the United States do not think beyond the borders of the country. Many people that you come into contact with every day would be astonished to see how many really cool little companies in the United States don't export. And uh, right. because the American market is big enough, I think that's a huge mistake. It's also a big advantage to entrepreneurs in countries such as India who do think internationally. So the United States is not, because there are so many companies here, there are many companies that export, but it is nothing compared to the number of companies that could export if people here thought more internationally. What would be your advice to somebody who's running a business in, in a country like India, a small business, aspires to be big, aspires to go global at some point, what would be your uh, advice to him, if you are advising him? I do have advice for those people. And aside from understanding the financial aspects of their company, I find that uh, successful people, Mihir, are open to 
input from other people, that they successful people seem to understand that they're good leaders, but they don't, uh, they are not experts in every field. Right now, and, and they surround themselves with people who do know all those answers. Now in a startup, that might be outside advisors. In a big corporation, there would be vice presidents and managers who would be the sources of uh, outside advice. But uh, this is important. I'm working with a company right now. They make a uh, product that is a, a hardware that's for a particular part of the tech industry. It's a small company. The company is led by a person who is unbelievably talented as a product engineer. He had the idea, he developed the key product, but a particular person is not very good at listening to advice. And as a result, although the product is terrific, marketing isn't very good in that company, investor relations practically don't exist, and funding strategies are you know, something that's only talked about on Sunday. I mean, this is an example of a person, it's a negative example, but it's an example of a person who is not seeking or following the advice of people who have been where he wants to go. He wants to be a successful entrepreneur. The opposite of that would be if he was still a product engineer who had developed a good product, but surrounded himself with, say, a good CEO, uh, a good CFO, uh, and a, a group of advisors who he would listen to. That would be ideal. And that is what I really love to see in uh, uh, young entrepreneurs. And th there are people who do those things, who admit, I don't know something. I don't know anything about marketing, so I better get good advice about marketing. And then there are people who do not uh, at understand themselves, that do not understand that there is an area where they are totally ignorant and need advice. So th th that's number one. If you would have uh, understand yourself, know your strengths, and take care of offsetting your weaknesses. I think that's a brilliant advice. Uh, I think uh, this interaction couldn't have happened at a better time because the whole world seems to be going through one transition, but I'm sure there's going to be plenty of light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, I think that is the time when we will reconnect and probably uh, discuss this whole global change once again. But thank you so much, Zev, for joining us. Your series is a fantastically beneficial institution for startup entrepreneurs. And I, I applaud you for putting the energy into it. Thank you so much. Thank you.